Welcome to episode 100 of the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shornstein and I am a board certified sports dietitian and endurance athlete. And actually, I had a different plan for this episode than you're getting, but it's okay because today's episode is so, so awesome. We are going to be talking all about sleep, but more on that in a second. I had actually hoped to do a best of episode, you know, best of the last five years, um, but the idea only occurred to me like one or two weeks ago, and it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't long enough for me to get my act together because I wanted to do one for athlete episodes and one for my dietitian episodes. So sadly, I did not put those together, but they are in the works. I will be doing that for end of year. Um, so I would actually love your input. What do you think should make it into the best of uh, episodes, those two episodes? Are there certain guests that you really, really enjoyed? Are there certain sections of a podcast that really resonated, certain quotes? I'd love, love, love to hear from you if you have any favorite moments from the past five years. And if you don't know, don't worry, I'll figure it out. I've got, I got my own favorites um, to kind of add to the little highlight reel here. But, um, but of course, I always, always love your input. All right, so back to today's episode. I am so excited for this interview. It's with a dietitian I met a year ago and have been looking forward to interviewing ever since. I have Melissa Azero here for you today, AKA the hormone dietitian, and she is joining me to talk about the nutrients, the eating patterns, supplements, and lifestyle behaviors that impact sleep. Melissa is an integrative and functional women's health dietitian who works with women struggling with hormone imbalance. And of course, sleep is one of these things that it's just affected by so many different things, including hormones. So I really thought that this would be a great topic for Melissa and I to cover together. We actually talked for just over 90 minutes. This is a little bit of a long one and we could have kept on going um, because sleep is just such a huge topic. But I think we did a good job highlighting um, some of the main things that you need to know. Just a heads up, this conversation has large sections that are very much focused on women. So whether it's talking about like hormonal shifts and other symptoms during perimenopause or other female specific challenges, um, just wanna let you know those are there. However, there are also many parts of this episode that are relevant to everyone. So men, don't worry, we didn't leave you out completely. <laughs> you can listen to this one too. All right, that's enough from me. Please enjoy my chat with Melissa Azero all about sleep. Melissa, welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. How are you doing today? Good. So happy to catch up with you and chat about this. I know it's going to be a really exciting and informative talk. There's so much to get into, so excited to, to get started. Yeah, and we met about a year ago at the Now Foods event, and I've been looking for a way to get you on the pod and I remember seeing a couple posts you did about sleep and I was like, oh my gosh, I've been meaning to do an episode on sleep for ages. You are perfect for this because of course sleep is such a multifactorial thing uh, that is of course affected by hormones and you're of course the hormone dietitian. So really wanted to talk all about it from all the different angles. But before we dive into today's topic, I always want my guests to share some background. Um, so a little bit about yourself as a dietitian, just so we can get to know you a bit better. Yeah, so I'm Melissa Groves Azero. I am the hormone dietitian, which is how most people know me. I am a second career dietitian. So I worked in New York City advertising. That's what I, so we kind of bonded over our New yeah, York yeah. background. <laughs> um, so I worked in New York City in advertising for 15 years and then went back to school to become a dietitian. And when I was, you know, sort of looking at, you know, what I had struggled with throughout my life and what interested me in areas where there was a lot of new science coming out, um, hormones and women's health in particular really were things that I was interested in. So I work uh, entirely in women's health. Um, I mainly work with women with PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome. But I also work, I don't have PCOS myself. I also work with women, you know, with symptoms being caused by hormone imbalances from things like endometriosis or estrogen dominance or PMS, PMDD. Um, and then as I've gotten older and transitioned myself into menopause, I've been doing more in the perimenopause and menopause space as well. And a little bit of, you know, another thing we we bonded on and where where I'm a good fit for this is I'm a, I'm also a runner so I ran um ran the New York City Marathon in 2008 um coming off of a ballet background and then running was sort of the thing that 
fulfill that need for me um, as an adult. I kind of took like a eight, nine year hiatus when I moved up to New England just because winter running here is is no so joke. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I kind of let it slip by the wayside when I was finishing up school and, you know, starting my business. And now I'm back again. I've been running again for about a year and a half. So, um, you know, trying to, to incorporate those principles of sports nutrition into the hormone balance and, and all of that. So, yeah, there's really a lot. I learn a lot from following you as well. Oh, thank you. So, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to love to chat more about all of this. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, I mean, you really summed up a lot of the things that we bonded over because, you know, the New York City piece, the career changing piece, the like really strongly identifying with something you know, for you as ballet, for me as music, and then finding running as like that outlet to like, because, you know, when you lose one identity, you feel this like need to grasp onto something else. And, um, but yeah, so I always appreciate learning about other people's journeys. And, um, you know, we're, we certainly aren't the only dietitians who are career changers. It's a, a popular second career, it seems. <laughs> right. We also have the gardening thing. Oh, yes. Yes. Which we have bonded over a lot of gardening. I have no idea what I'm doing in my garden, but uh, it's been fun to kind of play around with it and, and see what goes on. But, I um, joke yeah. that I'm like channeling my ancestors. I try to picture my, you know, <laughs> Italian uncles out there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Speaking of which, I my parents, because I, I, I I have two gardens, technically, I guess, because I plant one at my parents every year, which was my original like pandemic garden. And then I have my own garden. And of course, I haven't been back at my parents very often. I mean, they live five minutes away, but it's just, you know, it's hard to get over there yeah. sometimes. It is a very neglected garden. And my parents, like, there are so many tomatoes. And I, I asked my parents, I'm like, have you been down there to pick the tomatoes recently? And they're like, no, it's been like two weeks. I'm like, what are you doing? It's literally in your backyard. So I have to go over there. The poor garden is suffering. <laughs> There are a lot of tomatoes. There's some zucchini. There are a few pumpkins. My pumpkins have been kind of a fail this year. Um, but anyways, we digress. Let's get into today's topic, sleep. I know this what really, people are like, we don't care about your garden. I mean, I'm sure you do, but anywho, sleep, huge topic. We're, you know, as always, I, I keep taking on these huge topics, but um, again, I've been meaning to tackle this one so much because I think other than GI issues and dissatisfaction with weight, like sleep problems is probably one of the most common complaints. I don't know about your clients, um, but I hear them from my clients all the time. And again, there are so many things that can contribute to sleep issues, whether it's like diet or lifestyle behaviors, hormone imbalances, which we'll be talking about medical issues, things like pain, or of course, like children, pets, like noise. I mean, whatever. There are just like a million things that can impact sleep. So we're not going to cover everything, but we'll kind of do some highlights of, I think, the most important things. And I think we should start with hormones since you're the hormone dietitian. So um, I, you know, I, as you kind of touched on, you work with kind of peri and um, postmenopausal women and obviously other people have sleep issues too, but I was hoping we could spend some time on like the why and the how uh, hormone imbalances, particularly during this time period in women's lives impact sleep. Yeah, I would say it's probably, you know, short of that, you know, postpartum period mm. and then oh, yes. having, having small children, that would be mm. the other group yes. where sleep really suffers. Um, but other than that group where it's situational and temporary, yeah. what happens when we start to enter perimenopause and just a little bit of um, definitions just to lay mm -hmm. the groundwork for that yeah. is menopause is actually a single day. Menopause yes. is a single day 12 months after your last period. So you don't know at the time that it's your last period. Um, you know, it starts to happen um, as you enter into perimenopause, as your cycles start to get more and more erratic. Um, you know, I know I was, you know, 27 days on the nose for my whole life. And then it would start being like, 15 days, followed by 45 days, followed by 60 days. Um, so the periods start to get erratic, but perimenopause can last 10 to 12 years. So, you know, it's really not unusual for women to be entering into this in the mid to late 30s, early 40s, certainly. By then, you're, you're going to be noticing some of these um, impact of the hormone shift. But what's happening is you may not be ovulating every cycle. 
Um, ovulation is the only time we make significant amounts of progesterone. So the egg follicle, uh, the corpus luteum is what's responsible for making progesterone. So as our eggs are getting tired and wearing out, um, they're not great quality. We may be ovulating. We may not be making enough progesterone. We may not be making any progesterone. Um, progesterone, you know, we we it's progest, so it's the pregnancy supporting hormone. But some of the other things it does for us, it's calming. It it smooths, uh, calms, smooth muscle contractions. So that's to allow an egg to be able to implant. Um, but in terms of mood and sleep, you know, if we're not getting that, um, progesterone can cross your blood brain barrier and help you make GABA. GABA is our chill neurotransmitter. I always um, describe GABA like it's that first glass of wine at a party <laughs> where you're like, oh, yeah. every, I'm a little like more relaxed now. That's GABA talking. Um, so, you know, like we benefit from that half the month when we're having regular cycles, but when progesterone starts to flag, that can really impact sleep. Um, then as estrogen starts to drop, and this is happening later in perimenopause, it's very erratic throughout early perimenopause, but as estrogen starts to drop, um, that's where it results in those symptoms like night sweats. Mm -hmm. and hot flashes. And so I work with a lot of women in their, you know, mid forties who they'll start noticing it's typically the week before your period starts when hormones are at their lowest anyway, that they may mm -hmm. be experiencing some of these hot flashes and night sweats. Um, and that can wake you up because you're uncomfortable. Um, you know, and that really also goes along with just that that age in a woman's life where, you know, you're at the peak of, if everything's going well, you're at the peak of your career, you've probably got kids who are, you know, in puberty or, you know, older tween age kids, you've probably got aging parents as well. So, you know, it tends to be a pretty high stress period in a woman's life. So it's all kind of conspiring to make your sleep worse at that point. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's really what's what's happening there. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. And um, and then outside of that, I mean, I guess, well, it could include this time period of, of you know, perimenopause, menopause, but um, outside of that, what about just other hormone issues? And this can kind of, like, we're going to talk about diet kind of more globally and then get into the specific nutrients, but um, thinking about like cortisol and just other problems, low estrogen resulting from under eating and stuff like that. Maybe can we get into that a little bit? Yeah. So the um, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis can yep. cause sleep issues. Um, you know, that really, it's a sort of systemic issue because, you know, <laughs> we think about stress and stress raises your cortisol, right? Um, but I'm never, it's never like, oh, it's your fault you're stressed. Or, you know, I think we tend to think about stress as all of those external psychological factors contributing to stress, right? So we've got finances and our job and our relationships and our health and, you know, those sort of things that are, are weighing on us. Um, but internal sources of stress can also mess mm -hmm. with your adrenal hormone production. So when I'm talking about internal sources of stress, it's things like imbalanced blood sugar, um, not eating enough, not eating enough carbohydrates, um, you mm -hmm. know, under eating certain nutrients, um, the blood sugar balance, the inflammation, um, you know, the cortisol, what happens, uh, there's a really strong tie between blood sugar balance and cortisol. So if your blood sugar drops, when blood sugar drops, cortisol rises. So sometimes, especially for my folks who are waking up at like three in the morning, um, hmm. sometimes it's because blood sugar dropped too far and that's causing cortisol to rise too much and that's waking you up. You know, I think cortisol gets a really bad rap on social media. We, everybody thinks about it as it's your stress hormone. It yeah. makes you grow belly fat. It, uh, messes with your blood sugar. Um, but we wouldn't make cortisol if we didn't 
need it. It's actually anti-inflammatory up to a certain point, that spike that we get. Um, cortisol is literally our awakening hormone. So if you think about cortisol as the opposite of melatonin, you know, cortisol goes up in the morning, melatonin goes down, and then at night, melatonin comes up and cortisol goes down. So that can all get messed up if there are things other things impacting your cortisol. So sometimes, you know, for those people who are waking up late at, you know, in the middle of the night and having trouble getting back to sleep because they've got that hamster wheel brain going where once mm -hmm. it kicks in and you're just thinking about all those things you said and did in sixth grade that you regret <laughs> now and it's just like, <laughs> or you're thinking about all the things you have yeah. to do. Um, so sometimes something as simple as having a little snack high in protein before bedtime, like a yogurt or a cheese stick, or I'm a fan of a um, spoonful of nut butter before bed, um, just to sort of help see if that helps keep you keep you in bed. And then there's all the other, you know, psychological things that you can do. Um, I love that there's actual research on the uh, strategy of brain dumping before bed. So if you write down mm, everything yeah. that's in your head, you know, get it out of your head and on paper, and then you can tell yourself, I don't have to think about it. It's written down. I will take care of it when I wake up in the morning. Um, you know, everything is where it needs to be. My only job right now is to be asleep. So yeah, so cortisol, um, you know, thyroid to some degree. I do find exercise and exercise timing and type can absolutely impact sleep. I know, um, I know for me running because it's such an intense activity and I'm not, I'm not in such good shape that I can go for, you know, a low heart rate run. Like my mm -hmm. heart is you know, way up there when I'm going yeah. for a three mile jog. Um, yeah. So it's just, it's too intense for my body later in the day. And I, I find that impact sleep, you know, I'm lying there and my legs are buzzing and I'm just like, mm -hmm. but I can, you know, do a low, low intensity weights workout four or five o'clock at night with no issue. I can go for a walk after dinner with no issue. So yeah, there's a lot of factors to look at what's impacting your sleep and why. Yeah. The exercise one's really hard because like I get a lot of runners, for instance, or whoever else, but it's oftentimes runners in like, let's take New York City, for instance, and they're doing their run club and the run club meets after work. And, you know, New Yorkers are working kind of on the later side and then they're commuting all the way to Brooklyn or wherever they live. And suddenly it's like, and then, you know, we're talking about how, you know, they want to eat, but it's so late. And so sometimes they're not really eating. And so we're trying to get them to eat. And it's like, not only do we have the because it's not just an easy run it's usually like a speed session yeah it's like doing their like track workout at seven and then they're getting home at like nine something and then they're trying to get up you know get to bed go to work and so it's like there there's like the eating a bigger meal close to bed that we're trying to deal with but getting enough nutrition in and there's just so many things so it's it's often hard with like we have all these like lifestyle recommendations, diet recommendations, like all these different things that we're trying to juggle. And then we have like the logistics of just leading a realistic or whatever the life is, right? But just realistic things that we're dealing with. And and so, you know, whether, you know, we mentioned like kids and pets and all these things that aren't always in your control. And sure, you can decide not to go to the track workout, but for many people, they really love it. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is there. I mean, I know for me and my clients usually like, you know, so they're doing their session and we're just saying, Hey, you know what, just really make sure you prioritize the nutrition and have like a mini dinner before if you, whatever you can tolerate. And then afterwards, maybe we're doing like a really loaded smoothie or whatever, but it's hard. It's really hard for some people. I'm not an evening exerciser for the record. I hate working out at night. <laughs> Well, me, but... And there's the other end of the spectrum too, where yeah. I don't recommend people sacrifice sleep to get up yes. early and work out either. Yeah. Like, you know, waking up at 445 to go work out. Um, you know, if you can't get your act together at night to get to bed at a decent time. I mean, I think about like people who have to wake up early, right? Like, yeah show hosts and they're, they're yeah, yeah, yeah. joking. And you hear Kelly Ripa joking about it all the time that she's in bed by 7 p.m. And you really have to be because you, you need that sleep for recovery from the workout that you're doing. So I prioritize sleep above anything else. And I've sort of, you know, I feel very lucky at this point in my life that I've been able to build my business and, you know, my lifestyle around that. So 
you know, I don't, I was, I was just at the hairdresser today and we're scheduling my appointment. She's like, you want to do 8 a.m.? And I was like, no, 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 no I'm going to do 8 a.m. Um, because, <laughs> you know, I have found for me, um, the best thing for me is to be able to wake up naturally without an alarm clock, you know, and if I'm well rested, if I've been getting enough sleep, I'm not in a deficit, I will naturally wake up around 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, but the more the more days I have to wake up to an alarm clock, um, the worse I feel. So, you know, and I'm also very lucky that with my my business, I'm able to schedule my workouts in the afternoon, early afternoon, which is sure. a time workout is like my perfect time to work out. I feel great. It gives me energy for the rest of the day, but it doesn't impact my sleep. So I will break my day into two chunks where I'm working in the morning, take a little hour and a half break to get my workout in, shower, and then finish my work in the late afternoon to like six, seven o'clock, um, you know, where I'm making dinner and, and all of that and transitioning to that nighttime uh, period. But we can talk more about the <laughs> nighttime well, transition. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, my favorite time to work out is, because uh, I also have that flexibility now, is uh, right after I drop my kids off at school at 9 a.m., mm -hmm. right after my first breakfast and before my second breakfast. Yeah. So. Yeah, so but, but not every, but not everyone has that flexibility, and that's like such an important piece. Is like we, um, I mean, obviously there, you know, there are downsides to having your own business and having this flexibility. However, you know, not everyone has what we have in terms of schedule flexibility. So, I think it's really hard for people who do have to be at a job or wherever it is, like, or you know, they have other responsibilities, and literally the only time they have is early morning. I mean, I think you said it, which is like, okay, that's fine, but you need to prioritize getting to bed early then. And I think where this can get really tricky for some people, and it, it, some people are really good about doing this, but where it can get really tricky is like, if you do have, like, I'll just use one example. This is not obviously just one example, but like other parents of young children who like put their kids to bed and then they're just like, I need time to myself now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They'll stay up late when they shouldn't, um, which I'm definitely guilty of sometimes. But, um, you know, there are just times where, people are just staying up late watching TV or doing other things. And so I think it's just understanding that sleep is such this foundational thing along with nutrition and, and other lifestyle behaviors that is just so essential to health and understanding also that you are just not going to get as much out of all of these other things you're putting your energy into, whether it is your exercise routines or um, whatever else. Like you're just not going to get as much out of it if you don't prioritize sleep. You know? Yeah, one of the things I talk about when we have tricky schedules like this, I think there's sort of this myth that consistency means doing the same thing every day, right? Mm. And mm -hmm. that's just not the case. And, you know, in any well-designed exercise plan, um, whether you're training for something or not, there should be built-in rest days, right? So oh, yeah. If you're looking at, you know, and I always recommend putting your, your exercise on your calendar to make sure that it gets done and that you can move it away, you know, move it around as needed. Um, but one of the, the things is, okay, well, pick two weekdays where you get up early or two weekdays where you work out at night and the other days, you know, focus on doing, doing things at more appropriate times for your sleep. And then you know, it's okay to be a little bit more of a weekend warrior, you know, in terms of the workout. But if you're working, if you're working out two days during the week and two days on the weekends, like you're already doing better than 90% of other people, you know, at that point. So, you know, and understanding that sometimes things are, are seasonal, um, you know, it may not be the same schedule all year. Um, you know, think about like my teachers and, yeah. you know, I, I work with a lot of um, healthcare practitioners. Me too. A lot of nurses. Too. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and it's, most of them ha will have like three to four days on um, mm -hmm. and then the off days. So it's, it's con whatever consistency is for you and what sure. you can do within the confines of your your schedule. Yeah. So like yeah. maybe you do get up early two days a week, but the other days you get as much sleep as possible. Yeah. I think, I mean, I know from what I see in my clients, there are a lot of people who are prioritizing the time. Like they're like, I am carving out 
eight hours, seven to nine hours to go to bed, be in bed, but I am not getting good quality sleep. And I think that circles back to some of the things we were discussing, whether it's the perimenopause stuff or, you know, stress or other things that are happening. And hopefully we're going to provide some solution strategies through some of what we were talking about. But I do think there are a lot of people who really do give it their best effort and they're just like besides themselves. And I know I've been there on occasion and it's so frustrating when you're trying everything you can't sleep. Yeah. I think that's where, you know, the whole concept of boundaries comes in and, Mm. you know, I always recommend starting with the end point and then backing up from there. Right. So if I plan to be up by eight, that means I need to be asleep by 12 giving some give or take for being woken up by a cat or um, having to wake up and pee or waking up with uh, a lot of times for me, what will happen now is I will like just be falling asleep and I'll wake up with like uh, my internal furnace is, is raging. So, you know, wake up and strip and do all the things. Um, So, you know, I try to be in bed by 10 so that I can get up by eight um, that means that I've got to start my wind down routine by 9.30. That means I've got to be eating dinner by 7.30. That means I've got to be cooking dinner by 7. That means I've got to be done working at 6. So, you know, looking at my schedule from a holistic place and what I need to do to get to bed by 10, but 10 p.m. is a non-negotiable for me. My butt is in bed at 10 p.m. And, you know, I kind of joke about it. Like I have a rule in my house with my husband. Um, He can't ask me any questions after 10 p.m. Um, I love that. If it's 9.58, yeah, if it's 9.58, he wants to ask me, does this shirt go with this tie? I will happily answer for him. If it is 10.02, he is on his own too late ask me tomorrow like you know does he go to bed at the same time he he is in education so he actually okay get up at like okay okay four or 45 oh yikes okay Mm -hmm. my husband used to work my husband used to work new york hours and it was so brutal because we're on here in california and so yeah he was often working by four something yeah glad he's not doing that anymore (laughs) yeah it's rough it's rough i mean but again it's it's seasonal you know it's all year round um sure you know, so we're still kind of in that fall adjustment, getting back to the schedule. He's tired all the time right now, but, you know, catching up on weekends and that sort of thing. I like how you kind of gave that example of what you do. And of course, listeners remember that is just an example that yeah. is not your like plan for the evening. So it's it's taking your life because I'm thinking, I just went on a run with a friend this morning who has two little kids and actually one older one and one smaller one. And the older one has, they have all these crazy sports schedules. And she was talking about how they're struggling to have dinner before 8.30. And we were talking about ways that she can shift mm-hmm. dinner, ha- even have a family dinner at 6.30. And, and so we were like, talking about these things oh but you know practice doesn't end until seven on this night and this so like you know obviously we recognize that not everyone can finish work or finish this by a certain time so it's just again taking your life doing the best you can with it and figuring out what are you like what can you deprioritize so you can carve out this rest for yourself um Also, prioritizing for yourself and, you know, understanding that sleep needs change throughout your life. I completely Mm. was a person in my 20s who could get by on four hours of sleep and function fine. I mean, I I didn't know the impact on my adrenals at that point that I was probably (laughs) having, Um, but I could function fine. Now, you know, at this age and this place in my life, if I've had one minute less than seven hours, I am essentially useless. So, you know, I really need, need that sleep now. So, you know, understanding that that's changed for me and that sleep needs to be a priority at this point in my life where it may not need to be as much of a priority for you at your point, you know, or you might be someone who you sleep. I mean, I used to sleep four to six hours, but I I feel like I would get really efficient, really deep sleep in the time that I had to sleep. So if you're getting really good quality sleep, you might not need as much sleep. Can we talk about that a little bit more in terms of like what the official, well, well, yes. And I want to put, let's put a pin in that one because I definitely want to talk about that. But I also want to talk about 
um, official, like uh, quote unquote, official recommendations, research surrounding that. Cause I know I was just looking at something where it was like for different age groups, obviously when you're much younger, like, you know, growing, you know, kids, teenagers, since you need more sleep, you're mentioning your twenties. And I think I was reading something that for 18 to 64, it was like seven to nine hours. And then for 65 and up, it was less sleep. And yeah, I don't know if you want to say more about that. Yeah. So seven to nine would be like the recommendation for yeah. most people. Um, the bulk of the research, and remember, I'm working mostly with PCOS sure. and perimenopause. So um, most of, of the reading I've done around sleep has been around um, blood sugar balance, uh, yes. weight, ma weight management. Um, mm. You know, so from that... 6.5 seems to be the cutoff. So anything less than 6.5, even a single night, makes you more insulin resistant the next mm. day. Um, even a single night of less than 6.5 will make you not only have more carb and sugar cravings the next day, but it actually affects intake. So I think that's a little bit of like like if you're a little tired, a little vulnerable, and you're craving more sweets, you don't have the um, the capacity to sort of make the decision around that from um, a strong place, you know? So, yeah. so you are more prone to like, oh, I'm exhausted. Oh, look, there's cookies in the break room. I'm going to grab a cookie. I'm going to go back and grab another cookie. Like, you know, if you're tired, your body's going to be seeking quick energy from somewhere. So mm -hmm. yeah, it just makes you more vulnerable to making those those decisions that may not be in line with your goals for your health. Um, you know, I always talk about like, you know, my family is Italian. So if I've had a long, hard day at work, I want to come home and like bury my face in a bowl of pasta. And that is all <laughs> I want, right? Yeah. That's where like cognitive decision making me has to step in and be like, okay, you can have the pasta, but we're going to add some shrimp. We're going to add some broccoli. We're going to make this more of a balanced meal so that you're, you know, because that's more in line with your goals for yourself and how you want to feel later tonight and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as opposed to having, you know, the pizza on speed dial and eating a whole pizza, you know, it's just mm -hmm having that capacity to, to make those decisions like, okay, I'm going to have pizza, but I'm also going to have salad because um, that's how I want to feel later tonight and tomorrow. So yeah, it's, it's a little bit of, you know, the decision making around that, but 6.5 seems to be the threshold for, for most. So, you know, again, does that mean there are nights when I don't sleep, you know, uh, less than 6.5. Of course not. Things happen, you know. Um, it's just a matter of looking at your week. Where can I catch up? Um, I'm not going to Fancy this year. Fancy's our big dietitian conference, but Fancy Week, it takes me a month to recover from Fancy. Because... I've never been, but I hear it's crazy. <laughs> it's just, you know, you're, you're flying, you know, traveling, yeah, yeah, and that yeah. always impacts sleep. And then it's long days, early mornings, and, you know, you're, it's a week of getting like four to five hours of sleep a night. And yeah, it takes me a month to feel like myself again after after some a week like that that's actually a good let's I want to put that on in my brain for to talk about later is how to um how travel affects sleep and how we can support one like ourselves during that um let's yeah let's let's talk about diet um I mean we've already mentioned and this is a huge theme of the podcast that under eating whether it's acute or chronic, but especially chronic, uh, I mean, that affects everything. And sleep is most definitely one of those things. You know, I have people waking up hungry, or as you said, you know, these blood sugar drops will kind of wake you up. So we don't need to go more specifically into that. However, I think it would be helpful to talk about meal and snack timing and any other general eating patterns that you'd like to call out that relates to sleep before, and then we can move on to maybe some specific nutrients to kind of focus on. Yeah. So this goes back to the adrenals, right? Mm. So I always talk about the adrenals like they are two little grandmas that you carry around with you. So I call mine Betty and Ethel. You know, <laughs> and, and Betty and Ethel are like grandmas. They like early bird dinner. They like regular meal times. They like 
carbs and sweets. Like they like all the all the things that you would picture two little grandmas in their retirement yeah. home needing. Um, so that being said, like an earlier dinner, you know, I I'm a big fan. I'm not a fan of intermittent fasting for women of reproductive age, um, and not for most women in in menopause either. Um, and part of the reason for that is, is I do believe we need, you know, time to rest and digest, which is that natural sleep time. Um, but I do very much believe in circadian alignment. So starting eating when the sun comes up, stopping eating when the sun goes down, you know, our bodies are better able to handle carbs earlier in the day. That being said, it's very personal. Um, I... I'm like, my body's the opposite. Like I can't, I can't really do a super high carb breakfast or lunch. Like that just makes me feel like a slug in the afternoon. Like I just want to crawl back into bed. If I have oatmeal or pancakes or something like that, I'm just, I'm too tired. Um, I do. So I like strategically time my carbs around my workout. So I'll have like a carby snack before I work out and then like a protein shake and some fruit after I work out. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to work for me. But if I do not have a carb with dinner, that impacts my ability to relax and wind down at night. Um, you know, and we do we do sun basket pretty frequently. Um, mm, yeah, I've tried them before. Takes the pressure off of me for meal planning. You know, it's like mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. three meals a week. I don't have to think about. Um, but a lot of their you know healthier meal options are more like paleo. Um, so it'll be like fish and vegetables or something like that. So I always consciously make an effort to add a carb to that, you know, something like quinoa or sweet potato or pasta, or even, um, you know, if time is short and I don't have time to cook a carb, because of course the whole grains take the longest to yeah. cook. Which yeah. Is like yeah. Never <laughs> happening on a weeknight. Um, you know, do some like garlic bread on the side or something just to get some Mm -hmm. you know, concentrated carbs in with dinner. Um, we have entered squash season though. So that yes. is, that is the favorite. The <laughs> I is saw you post a delicata squash and it was at the supermarket and I saw it and I'm like, yep, getting that. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, delicata influenced. Has, like, influenced. <laughs> that's a chokehold on me for like three years now because it's it, so good. It, does, it cooks really fast, you know, it roasts in like 25 minutes. Um, it's great with all the fall vegetables. Um, so yeah, like making an effort to include carbs with dinner. Um, I do see the under eating, especially in relation to the exercise. And I'm sure you talk about, um, you yeah. know, the relative energy. Mm. And just, just had a whole episode on that. <laughs> you no, know, it's like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna work out like an athlete, you have to fuel yourself like an athlete and you have to recover like an athlete whether you consider yourself an athlete or not, if you are working out four to five days a week, you probably need to start looking into some of those things um, to support your body. But I assume most of the people who listen to you are. Yeah. Are and, that's, there, so. and that's where, and that's where I, where I would interject with what you were saying about, I mean, you were talking about your own personal experience with carbs. Mm -hmm. So obviously when I'm working with athletes, like, I don't care if you want a carb or not, you're freaking eating the carbs. <laughs> I mean, it's like, sorry, well, we're going to make sure you get the protein, the fat and other things, but you got to eat the carbs at all your meals because your carb needs are really high, um, especially when I'm working with my endurance athletes, right? So it yeah. depends. It really depends on who you are, what you're doing, what your needs are, you know, all of that. So um yeah, yeah, as you were saying, you're you're not running as much and doing that. So that's the only thing I would kind of call out there. I'm running like 10 miles a week. It's like yeah. not not massive mileage. Um, but I do want to interject and say, because I see this a lot in my mm. PCOS clients who are, okay. you know, they're exercising multiple mm -hmm. times a week. Um, they're trying to follow a low carb diet because that's what they, you know, that's what they think is appropriate yeah. for PCOS. And, you know, even the studies on, on low carb diets in PCOS, it's 40% of carbs a day, which is not 50 That's grams not, a day. Yeah, it's, it's not like low. 160 <laughs> to 200 grams. Sure. And then the more you're active, the more you're working out, the more we need to add to that. So I always, sure. you know, end up working with these people with PCOS who like think they need to be low carb, but the sports nutrition principles actually trump the PCOS nutrition principles when it comes to yeah. carbs. And yep. we really do have to 
focus on, and you know, we talk about quality carbs sure, and, exactly. and all of that, but, but there's a lot more wiggle room there with carbs, you know, even with insulin resistance and blood sugar balance issues. If you are working out intensely multiple times a week, we need to support that nutritionally. Yeah. Well, it's even like with diabetes and people are thinking they have to remove all carbs. It's like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> Yeah. That is not the advice. And and sometimes it's, I mean, there's, of course, just general carb phobia, but there's also a lot of misunderstanding from physicians giving advice. Well, first of all, what does low carb even mean? It's very relative. And I think people automatically go to like as close to zero as possible. And it's just, it's such a confusing world out there. So. Yeah, I talk more about like mindful consumption of yeah, carbs, yeah, yeah, making yeah. smarter carb choices, yep. mindful consumption of sugar even. You know, so many people think, oh, we need to eliminate sugar if you have PCOS. And it's like for forever, like this is a lifelong condition. You're going to tell someone to just never, ever have sugar. And there are times, you know, like with the sports nutrition, there are times when strategically sugar makes sense because we absorb it more easily and, you know, it's help there to support the workout. So, you yeah. know, I talk about like mindful consumption. We use like the WHO guidelines or the American Heart Association guidelines for sugar. And even then with, with my people who are very active, you can afford to go above and beyond that sometimes. Like I don't, I don't even like count or worry about the um, sugar that's in my electrolytes when I'm going for a long run or, yeah. you know, the, any sort of that immediate fueling, I'm not really doing long enough runs to like fuel on my run, but I will purposely fuel before my run. And I don't mm -hmm. even, I don't even worry about that. That's not a thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The whole sugar, yeah. Sugar thing. I mean, there are lots like, so PCS is one condition. I mean, there are lots of different, you know, if we're just talking medical conditions, like you can think about like, Oh, like at a lot of, athletes who of course have different chronic disease or different things going on, whether it's like, Oh, I'm trying to lower my triglycerides and my LDL. Okay. Well, balancing your blood sugars is really important there too. Right. So, um, but we're not going to worry about right before or during exercise. That's where you're going to take in those simple sugars. Um, mm -hmm. but maybe if you're like, yeah, the more mindful consumption outside of that focus on quality carbohydrate. And then if you are going to consume, added sugars or even a natural sugar, like can we pair it with a protein or a fat or a fiber, you know? So it's just, again, it's talking, it's thinking about like how you're incorporating these things. And it's going back to what you were talking about with ordering the pizza and having a salad or having the pasta with shrimp and broccoli. You're not saying, I, I just I have to highlight, you're not saying don't have the pasta, don't have the pizza, enjoy the thing you want. Mm -hmm. It's just enjoying it in a more balanced way, yeah, which exactly. um, again, for certain people, this will look so different depending on what your needs are. If you're training for an ultra marathon, you need a lot of pasta <laughs> compared to probably your portion of pasta would be very small compared to, you know what I mean? So we, we, this is why nutrition always has to be individualized, but I think there's some important themes going on that, that we want to focus on there. And I think that, you know, there's that periodic or cyclical um, mm -hmm. aspect to sports nutrition too, where if you're training for a big event, now is not the time to, to try to lose weight. You know, oh, like yes. your, your goal is performance performance mm -hmm. and, you know, be able to train adequately and not get injured and, you know, not get sick and fuel your, your performance. Um, you know, now is not the time to cut back on, on, uh, nutrients at all. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are so many people I get who are perimenopausal women who have gained weight, who are training for a race, who are struggling with their weight and having all these sleep and GI issues and they're freaking out. And it's just like, ah. yeah, but we, that's a tangent. Can we talk about those ladies for a second because oh, yeah. I think what happens, you know, in that time, and, you know, I'm a cardio queen too. I would cardio till the cows come home. Give me a podcast. Give me, you know, me too. some good tunes. Like, I'm one of those people who's like meant to do a six mile run, ended up doing a 10 because it was so gorgeous out and the leaves were crunching and I was just like so happy, you know, or I'm on the beach and I'm like, Oh, this is, you know, so I, I yeah, will, I get I it so forever. <laughs> I'm happy like on an elliptical, I mean, whatever, like I will do any of it. Um, we need to lift weights in perimenopause. We have to start lifting weights in perimenopause because that is ultimately what's responsible for metabolism and keeping our bones strong and maintaining that muscle mass. And so, you know, we kind of can't do the things that we always did. And I think the instinct is to keep 
cutting the calories down or increasing the cardio. It's like, you're just pouring more fuel into something that's not working for you. Like it's time to realize that it's not working for you and start doing something else. Um, yeah. And that's where the the weights come in. And and I love that, you know, there's really the weightlifting, like you can weight, you can lift weights for general muscle and bone strength. You can lift weights to support your running. You know, I've got all these little like exercises that I do now to support my running. Um, and it's really, you know, personal and what works for you. But yeah, we can't keep doing the things we were doing um, if they're not working and just yeah. decide, decide, oh, well, if I just do more of what I'm doing, it's going to work better. And it's, it's not. Is there, yeah, no, 100%. And I hate lifting no. weights, but I know I need to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any research and maybe not, but is there, or actually it probably is, is there any research connecting lifting weights, muscle mass to sleep? You know, that you know of. I haven't, I haven't come across anything okay. on that. I'm just curious since we're talking about more, you know, the, the weightlifting, maintaining muscle mass, um, you know, is really more the holistic yeah. uh, piece. Like you're going to feel better overall. Um, I haven't, I haven't seen anything specifically yeah. tying lifting weights to sleep quality or length. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I just haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, I've not seen. Yeah, I don't think I've seen anything there either. Um, let's before we dive into some specific nutrients, timing of eating and bedtime. Cause yeah. I, I think, you know, we see things like, okay, and, and you mentioned even like having a protein rich snack to help you sleep mm -hmm. or even like a nut butter, whatever. Um, and then the advice of not eating too close to bed, like allowing two hours or so. But I think again, this might be a little bit of an individual thing too and what you eat matters. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I would say two to three hours, depending on how quick your digestion is. Like you shouldn't be going to bed feeling like your stomach is full. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that also increases risk for things like heartburn where, you know, you don't want to lie down after yeah. a meal. So ideally, you know, give yourself two to three hours. Uh, one thing I talk about a lot with um, you know, people who are working on blood sugar balance is if you are going to have a dessert um, as close to dinner as possible. So, you know, get that balanced meal in that's got the protein, the fat, the fiber, and then have the dessert immediately following that and not two hours later, because then you're yeah. putting sugar into an empty stomach. Um, I got to test that wearing a CGM and it was, it was really cool to see that it actually does make a difference. Um, mm -hmm. For science, for science, I ate uh, six dark chocolate peanut butter cups um, uh -huh. after my- For my, science, in, for in quotes, science. for my, my listeners. Like, I love to, you know, I'll have like <laughs> a salad with protein for lunch is a pretty common, you know, lunch for me. And I'll, mm -hmm. then I'll go grab my little two dark chocolate peanut butter cups. Um, just to, you know, finish it mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for science, I decided to eat six one time and see what happened. And um, it really didn't spike my blood sugar at all. Um, it just, you know, because I had had the, the um, I remember landing pad. Did you talk about landing pads in college mm -hmm. where you would like put no. a landing pad in before you would go out drinking? Like, put, put Oh, well, I, well, I, I think we would just talk about lining our stomach or I don't know, but yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. So like I think about it as like a landing pad of like mm -hmm. your, your protein, fat, fiber yeah. meal yeah. and then put the dessert in. Um, but yeah, like a single handful of chips on an empty stomach um, spiked my blood sugar like crazy. So yeah, so mm -hmm. you want to eat your dessert close to to dinner or make it a balanced dessert, you know, instead of just ice cream, sprinkle some walnuts and some sliced strawberries, make yourself a little Sunday situation. Um, again, you don't want to be eating too close to bedtime because you don't want to be disturbing your sleep. Um, the snack would come in for people who are finding themselves consistently waking up at, at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. Oh, okay, got it. Um, we might experiment with, okay, well, let's try eating a protein snack before bed. And that's something like a yogurt or a cheese stick or nut butter or, you know, one of those little pre-made protein shakes that's like 20 grams mm -hmm. of protein. How close to bed would you say in that case? Like an hour, you know. It's, yeah. We're not talking a volume of food that's going to sure, be sure, sure. in your stomach, just like yeah. oh, snacky snack. 
Um, I do say, and I, I have this happen sometimes where people do wake up in the middle of the night. Um, and if you're up for a long time, you know, if you're up for like more than an hour, sometimes you start to feel hungry, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I do recommend getting up and having a snack if you are hungry. Um, and then almost immediately you'll be able to go back to sleep. But you, know, you think about meals should be keeping us full for four to six hours. So, you know, if you're waking up two, three in the morning, it's been, you know, eight hours since you last ate. It's, it's true. You feel hungry because you are hungry. So, yeah. you know, getting up, having a snack, go back to bed. Um, and, you know, again, the goal with that is just to support the sleep because now yeah. – if your stomach's grumbling, you're not going to be able to fall back asleep. Totally. And I, so I used like those evening snacks with my athletes who have, you know, a lot of people I work with have just had like really high energy needs and mm -hmm. there's only so much you can eat at a meal. Yeah. Right. So we're very strategic about snacks during the day, eating a little bit more frequently. Um, and then including sometimes that evening snack, especially if they're having an early dinner. So like, and you know, even like when you're talking about circadian patterns like eating when it gets dark well as you know we're about to enter that time of year where it gets yeah. dark super early so like for you know so for that you know obviously we're we might eat a little after dark and then have that snack so um and this is again where you just have to really you know think about what your individual schedules are needs are what you're training for like what's going on um because everyone's so different with this stuff um, um i know i think um you know with the like amount of nutrients to put in and mm -hmm. I just think about like how hard it's been like I've been able to maintain muscle mass um throughout menopause but like in terms of like gaining muscle I would have to make eating my full-time job like I don't know yeah I don't know how I would get in that many calories like or I protein like add. so much protein Pro mm -hmm. the protein I do I'm really okay. a rock star with the protein but and you know it's like if I'm already eating like 2400 calories it's like like i don't i don't know how much i would have to eat to yeah. actually gain muscle but it's more than i currently am and i well that's where you know I, when i'm working with my ultra endurance athletes my iron and mlf i mean they're needing like three four thousand mm -hmm. plus calories it's this is where like liquid nutrition like we're really again strategic with the snacks I mean, there's just so many things we have to stay on top of um, so, you know, parts of this conversation may not be uh, relevant to you guys, just FYI, yeah. <laughs> but it's all good. Um, all right. So let's talk about specific nutrients to avoid or include. Um, we haven't talked about caffeine and alcohol. Those are, of course, two important, important things as it relates to sleep. So why don't we start there? Yeah. So caffeine, um, I find with caffeine, it really, again, is very personal. Some people are faster metabolizers of caffeine. They can have caffeine and it doesn't really seem to impact their sleep. Um, that's that's really me. I could have an espresso at 9 p.m. and go to sleep. I don't understand you people. <laughs> but you exist. <laughs> Some people are very sensitive. And if you yeah. have more than one cup of coffee and after like 8 a.m., it will impact your sleep. Yeah. So, you know, it really depends on the person. Generally, I feel like, you know, I'm working with people in their 30s and 40s. Like they know how they are. Like you, you yeah. know whether it's yeah. okay for you or not. Um, yeah, so it's really personalized. Um, I do generally tell people not to have caffeine after two or three in the afternoon. And if they do have caffeine in the afternoon, like say they drink coffee in the morning, if they do in the afternoon, it's something more like, you know, what's in a pre-workout or like a green tea. So like less caffeine than what's in a coffee, sort of a, a yeah. gentle. And, you know, a lot of that is like with people who work later in the day or work yeah. nights, um, you know, and that, that seems to be okay. Um, you know, caffeine really, the, the, the science is so, um, mixed on it, you know, um, we're constantly getting like, there was just that great study that came out. I think it was last week about three cups of caffeine protects against, was it liver cancer? Oh, I didn't Part see that one. News last week. Okay. Um, so three cups of coffee a day. Um, so I, you know, I don't think that caffeine should be demonized. Um, however, um, it's one of those things we should consume consciously, you know, be yeah. aware that we're taking it in, be aware of how much we're taking in. Um, during the pandemic, that was, that was the one for me where it's like coffee just, gives me so much joy. 
Um, I love coffee. I love coffee culture. I love everything about the taste, the smell, all of it. Um, mm -hmm. So I would find myself making that third cup um, <laughs> just yeah. because I wanted it, not because yeah, I yeah. felt like I needed it. And so that was something I had to like consciously step back for um back from during the pandemics is like no this is out of hand even for me like this is too much mm -hmm. um you know just understanding that it, it could impact your stress levels your anxiety yeah. and all of that can contribute to worse than sleep alcohol alcohol yeah i, I hate to say it um I hate to say it because you know again there's there's a certain you live in california it's like wine country like yeah you know, there's like, wine is fun, drinks are fun, there's a social aspect to it. Uh, alcohol is doing your sleep no favors. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, especially when they're younger, will rely on, you know, alcohol to help them fall asleep. Um, and it does, you kind of like pass out on alcohol. But it will wake you up in the middle of the night. It actually leads to more disturbed sleep. And, you know, there's blood sugar imbalances ha happening during that. Your liver is focused on ridding your body of that toxin and not on all of the other jobs that your liver is supposed to be doing. Um, you know, especially I would say like perimenopause is when women start to come to the conclusion that the effects are just not worth it anymore. Me. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, you, that would be nice, but I really just don't want to deal with if how I'll you, feel the next. I'm so hungover the next morning. It's like sleep, but also the next day. If you wear horrible. a tracker at all, you know, you mm. can see one, one drink will spike your heart rate. It will tank your, um, your HRV level mm -hmm. will tank. Um, you know, and again, that takes like, it can take a week to recover from one drink. Um, so yeah. yes, you kind of like come to the conclusion that it's not worth it. Um, sort of in that neck of the woods, but not quite. Um, I'm a huge fan of CBD. Mm. Huge, oh yeah, let's chat about that. Huge fan of CBD for sleep. And especially, you know, the um, like CBG, CBN. Um, What's CBG? CBG CBN. is the one for pain. Yes. So if you have like aches and pains that yeah, are yeah. leading to being difficult. I've to used like a cream on my back before. Like we have some of that. Yeah. Yeah. I am. Um, I love the creams. Like if we go to New York and, you know, I'm walking 30,000 steps a day or something, I always like <laughs> will slather that on yeah. my feet when I get back, yeah, yeah. you know, legs up the wall with, with uh, THC cream on my feet yeah. um, just to help. But yeah, I'm a huge CBD um, is anti-inflammatory as mm -hmm. well. Um, the CBN, you know, that's the sleep one, um, but okay. CBD itself can help with sleep. And, you know, there are experts in this, um, you know, and mm -hmm. it's a matter of playing around and, and figuring out what, what works for you, what ratios work for you. Um, personally, I, you know, I like like a five milligram CBD, um, to sort of just calm me down, help me. Is that sleep. like a gummy? What would that be? Yeah, I like the gummy. Oh, gummy, I'm okay. a gummy okay. gummies or tinctures. I like the tinctures too. Okay. I'm yeah. Like I've tried gummies. I've had really weird responses, like only a few times, but I don't know if I took too much or I don't know. I felt really funny with it. Most so of it's one of those gummy, things you have to play around with. Yeah. Yeah. And most of the gummies take a couple hours to kick in. So like, uh, you know, if you are using it for sleep purposes, like I'm a fan of taking a gummy with dinner so by the time uh, okay by the time I'm going to bed I feel calmer um mm. you, know, you can build a tolerance to those too sure. so you know but that's that's one thing that that can help um you know to, to segue into the nutrients um things that yep. can help um you know with those other adapt I would consider a CBD kind of like in the adaptogen category it's an mm. herb it's a helpful yeah herb, you know yeah and we're going to talk about supplements for sure, but, um, yeah, um, uh, chamomile tea, um, mm -hmm. Tulsi tea, which is, uh, holy basil, uh, magnesium glycinate. I like yep. for bedtime, um, you know, any of those calming herbs, like, um, like lemon balm or valerian, um, you know, there are combo products. I'm, um, 
you know, with the herbs, I'm always looking for quality. So there's really only like two companies I will buy herbs from. Um, I like Herb Farm and Gaia, you know, because they're both like certified B cores and they're grown in America and like, you know, just the quality. I, I would not mm-hmm. recommend buying these things off of, you know, some rando company on Amazon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, you have to be so careful with Amazon. I have started growing some herbs. So I grow, oh, nice. um, yeah, I grow lemon balm. So I just harvested yeah. a bunch to dry, to make tea, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to make tea with. So yeah, like, you know, but those general, like traditional medicinals teas, yeah. you know, quality herb teas that have a uh, quality ingredients in them can all help. But again, it's, you know, I feel like uh, I do a lot of things personally to support my sleep. So I feel like it's a matter of kind of trying things out, seeing what you like, seeing what doesn't like. Cause like, especially with the, um, with the CBD, um, you know, some of the ones that are formulated for sleep are very high doses. They're like 25 milligrams of CBD. Oh, wow. And um, just knock you out. (laughs) It's not to knock out, it's the like more difficult to wake up in the morning. Like almost well, kind of like mel it's kinda like melatonin. Like why are the like there's just so much melatonin? I mean, I know we're like basically in supplement territory, so we'll just go here first. Yeah, <laughs> we'll I mean, I'll back to nutrients in a second. Uh, in foods, I mean. But um but like people always think about taking melatonin. That actually isn't the best thing, especially because the dosage is so high. Let's yeah. talk about that for a minute. If I put someone on melatonin, it's like, or recommend that they try it yeah. It's in the one to three milligram range. Um, so yeah, a lot of the melatonin supplements that are out there are like 10 milligrams, yeah. um, which is a lot. Uh, I'm always looking at, you know, I'm looking at how well someone's methylating. I'm looking at how much melatonin do they have. Um, so like melatonin's not great for some people. If you're already sort of on the higher end with melatonin, that maybe overkill and not what you need. Um, I, I I don't use melatonin. I recommend using melatonin um, sort of strategically for jet lag, like with the travel. Mm. Um, I do use melatonin sometimes in my fertility patients because oh, interesting. melatonin is actually also a really strong antioxidant. And there's a lot of melatonin in the um, follicular fluid surrounding the egg cells. So you know, it's sort of like, I like to use things that kill more than one bird with, with mm-hmm, one stone. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, it's an antioxidant and it can help you get a little more sleep. So, you know, but again, like 0.5, one milligram, three milligrams, like the max that I'm doing. I think people just assume that like, oh, more it's a higher better. dose. It'll make me sleep better. And it's like, actually, no. <laughs> yeah. That's actually why I prefer CBD to, um, yeah alcohol because I feel like if you have alcohol, you wake up and you're headachy and dehydrated and you feel gross, but CBD makes you thirsty. So, you know, you're like basically chugging water. You have the best night of sleep ever and you wake up like ready to take on the day. So it's just, it's night and day for me between CBD and alcohol and like the impact on your next day. Mm -hmm, (laughs) mm -hmm. You know, you wake, wake up after CBD and go for a run. Like, I'm not yeah. going for a run even after like a half a glass of wine these days, you know? Yeah. With uh with travel and melatonin, when would you recommend taking that? Like like we're talking, say, like time zone changes, right? So I mean I'm assuming at least. Um yeah, yeah when and how much would yeah, you that, recommend taking I used that? To, um I used to travel quite a bit. I was traveling to Europe like at least once a month um in my advertising job and You know, one of the things that that I had sort of discovered was to get on that time zone as quickly as possible. Um, Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, normally you're flying overnight to Europe, you're getting there, it's early morning. Do not lie down. Do not go to the hotel and lie down. (laughs) I would go to the hotel, change into my running clothes and run down, you know, whatever, run down the Rhine or wherever I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And just get on that schedule have, you know, normal day and then go to bed after dinner. And then by the next day you're on. So I would like that night would be the night, but you're probably pretty able to pass out going that direction if you're going east. Um, Going west, I've never had any trouble either because 
I'm always that person who's like falling asleep in my dinner at like 7 p.m. when I, <laughs> yeah. when I do fly to the West Coast. Um, I don't know. I guess I haven't done that much traveling. And if I'm if I'm traveling, it's only an hour or two. I just kind of yeah. take advantage of that. I know that trip we were on, um, you know, I was able to attend that 7 a.m. sunrise yoga class. Oh, God. Yeah. For me, <laughs> I was very tired. Very for me, tired. it was 8 a.m., which felt yeah, sure. more, you know, normal. So I, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of thing we don't worry about. Um, mm-hmm. It's really just, you know, to help yourself adjust to... Yeah the time zone. I've definitely, um, in the past had, um, like prescription sleep stuff go wrong. Oh, (laughs) I, I, yeah, my parents are doctors and we used to have all these samples of, um, oh God, what's it? I'm like totally blanking on the name. I used to take, was this what's some, the Sonata was the one you were supposed to take in the middle of the night, but Ambien for sure. Ambien, thank you. I was like, what's yes. the main one? Yeah, we used to have all these samples of Ambien floating around. Uh, I went yeah, to a fun. party. Like, I went to a party in Mexico. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, fun fact the night, the first night of our honeymoon, um, uh, we had a really nice hotel and we got, you know, we had this fun first day and we got into bed. And it was this beautiful bed and we closed the curtains and we each popped ambience because it was after a crazy Mm -hmm. wedding weekend and we just went to sleep and that was the best night ever. (laughs) We're like, sleep is amazing. And then we had all the fun, but you know, uh, so yeah, ambient, I miss you ambient, but yeah, you see you anymore. I woke up one morning in Mexico and like my, like my fancy dress was like on the floor next to the bed and I was like, why is my fancy dress out? And, you know, the the person I was with was like, oh, you wore that at the party last night. And I was like, what party was that? <laughs> so apparently, like, I had gone back to the room and gone to bed early. And then it was like, oh, there's this party happening in the lobby. Get dressed and come out. And I – Like, you, oh, my God, like, you took the ambient to, to go to sleep and then woke up at – Oh, that's woke crazy. Up in the morning, I was like, why is my dress on the floor? It's like, oh, oh my God. The party. I was like, what party? The that's one with the, one with the band. Crazy. What band? It's like, no recollection. It's not there. Oh, that's scary. I've heard about like ambient sleepwalking and eating and stuff like that, but now we can add ambient party going. <laughs> I went to a party. Yeah. Or the people on the plane who like try to like climb under the seats and stuff. Yeah, that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll I'll share one more ambient story. I was I went like solo backpacking when I was 25 around South America and on I mean, this was the stupidest thing I could have done. I was on like an overnight bus. It was like a really long bus. I think crossing from like, I don't know, Peru into Bolivia. I mean, just, you know, not like exactly the safest thing. And I was by myself and I decided to take an Ambien because of course, why wouldn't you do that? But it was crossing a border. So like border patrol comes on and you need your passport and you need to like go outside and they search all your stuff. And I guess I did all this when I was kind of asleep. I don't know. Right. It's like the stupidest possible thing you can do. Um, but yeah, anywho, no more Ambien. Ambien's gone for my life. No, um, yeah. No, so without Ambien, let's out, talk. Out. We're going to go back to nutrients and foods because obviously we're food first people here. But um, since we're on the supplements things, let's go over supplements that can help because there are a number of ones, whether it's like ashwagandha or L-theanine, or we mentioned magnesium glycinate, um, you mentioned chamomile, lemon balm, all these things. Um, what What are some ones you want to call out and are certain ones better for certain populations? Ooh, yeah, I think, you know, I'm always talking about root causes, right? So Mm -hmm. if somebody is not sleeping, you know, we kind of have to figure out why, why that is. What's the reason they're not sleeping? And then ideally try to pair a strategy or a supplement to what's the ultimate reason, you know. I would say probably the most common one would be cortisol issues, you know, these adrenal issues, high stress. So then we're going to be looking at the things that can impact cortisol, like ashwagandha, L-theanine, phosphatidylserine is another one, Um, you know, really those kind of calming ones. Mm -hmm. Um, Then we've got the hormone imbalance ones, you know, if low estrogen is the reason you're waking up from hot flashes or night sweats, you know, you might want to discuss HRT or, or they call it MHT now, menopause hormone therapy with mm-hmm. your gynecologist. Um, mm-hmm. During perimenopause, you might want to discuss 
progesterone supplementation with your, you know, gynecologist. And there's, there are over the counter progesterone, like creams that, that mm-hmm, can mm-hmm. Be during this time too. Um, so yeah, so if it's hormones, we want to be addressing the hormones. If it's blood sugar balance, we want to be addressing blood sugar balance. So it really kind of depends on what's going on, but yeah, you mentioned, um, those ones, uh, reishi is another one that I love. Oh, the mushrooms? Yeah. So there's, um, I actually really love the, um, I don't buy a lot of their stuff, but the, the Four Sigmatics Mushroom Coffee people, they make these little packets oh. of rain mm-hmm. hot chocolate. No. Oh. So like that's a nice little bedtime treat because it's got the reishi, which is very calming. It's got the chocolate, which has magnesium. Um, you know, if we're looking for food sources of magnesium, chocolate mm-hmm. is a good one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you could do that yourself, um, like raw cacao powder in a little, you know, smoothie, banana milk smoothie, mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. a small smoothie, kind of make it yourself. Um yeah, so it really kind of depends what's going on, what we're going to reach for and suggest for most people. Um, with PCOS, one of the things that we end up talking about a lot is sleep quality because yes, sleep disorders are much higher in that population. Um, you know, and we always, uh, I always, you know, learned that uh, sleep apnea was like the big truck driver's disease, right? They're like big, they're yeah. inflamed, they're probably smoking. Like, you know, they're not like active, you know, they're not physically active. Um, yeah, yeah. But in PCOS, in PCOS, sleep apnea happens at a higher rate regardless of weight. So it's more to do with the inflammation than with the weight. But if you do have, mm-hmm. you know, access to weight and inflammation, then, you know, even more likely. So, you know, I have had uh, several clients who, you know, we've recommended further sleep testing for to rule out some of these sleep conditions because, you know, and that's especially if you, if you are getting like eight hours of sleep, but you're still waking up and feeling not rested, mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. you might want to look into that. Actually, my husband this week, I had never heard of this. I didn't know it was a thing. Um, he's doing an at-home sleep apnea test. And oh. so there's he sticks a thing to his forehead. <laughs> um, and I think he has okay. to wear it for three nights. Um, and then he mails it back and, and they'll tell him. But, um, oh, wow. you know, because he was saying he didn't think he'd be able to sleep in, a, you know, the clinical sleep center. setting. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So there, he's doing the home one. Um, I assume it's like with the Fitbit, because I mean, the Fitbit tells you if you're moving around yeah. or not. Um, I don't know. Huh. Yeah, my parents both have sleep or recently diagnosed with sleep apnea, and they and they're not like overly large people either. But um, yeah, but they they yeah went to the sleep centers, and that's where they got their ambient. <laughs> I guess they give them a sleeping pill to just make sure they get sleep. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. Awesome. And uh, one of the ones, you know, I was looking at the, the post you made in, in Instagram and you mentioned mm. hops and milky oats and passion flower. And I had never heard of those for, I mean, at least those aren't things I've ever recommended. And I was curious yeah, who you use those with. They're generally in combinations of things. So if you okay. buy like, you know, like a herb farm sleep tincture, or like a guy okay. sleep capsules. Um, those will be the ingredients, but milky oats is a calming one. Um, I know it's also in, you know, Ayla Barmer's, um, full well prenatal. She had also oh, okay. designed, it's like a calming nervine tonic for women who are pregnant. So it's like a calming tonic, but it's herbs that are specifically safe for pregnancy. And so milky oh, okay. oats is always one that, mm-hmm is recommended there. Uh, hops I've been loving. Um, so hops is, you know, it's the, what they make beer out of, but there are really powerful antioxidant compounds in hops and specifically, um, really powerful phytoestrogens in hops. Um, so I've been buying, I like to, uh, you know, in the absence of, of a cocktail, uh, at night, I like to have a little fun, mocktail or something you know mm-hmm. like I go I get to go through my progression from coffee to matcha to seltzer yeah. to like, <laughs> um you know I like to do something fun before yeah. dinner and so that's where like the kombucha will come in or I'll make a yeah. mocktail with um 
tart cherry juice is one that I recommend yep. a lot. Yeah, um, that's one on my on my nutrient list. Yep. <laughs> yeah, because it is like a natural melatonin can help you produce your own melatonin. Mm -hmm. It's got the sports benefits too yep. with the anti-inflammatory, mm -hmm. antioxidants. So like, you know, a little bit of tart cherry juice, some seltzer, some lime juice in there. Um, but the hops, there's uh, a couple brands that I've been seeing of um, hops water. So it's basically I was water. I have a client who was telling me about hops water, and I'd never heard of it before. And I was like, "What is this? I, does that taste good?" Because I don't I know. I really like it. it is does, it bitter? It does. Yeah. Well, I like bitter. Like okay. I love Eat bitter. bitter. So I okay. actually buy the um the one that I've been buying is the. Uh, red grapefruit one so okay it's like bitter on bitter oh wow okay so it's flavored what oh interesting okay yeah hmm. and they have little flavors but i think there's a blood orange one too but okay. i i'm so like i love i'll buy red grapefruit anything like anything um mm -hmm. so yeah it's like a you know seltzer water so that can help with the relaxation too um mm, but also can okay. help with the estrogen component um if you're struggling with hot flashes and night sweats. Oh, that's um, good to know. And then I should probably talk about with that also the um, environmental concern, you know, when, yep. you're, when you're sleeping, like really making your bedroom a retreat, you know, it should be cool. It should be dark. There should be no flashing electronics. Um, if you, if your partner is an electronics user, you know, getting yourself one of those fancy sleep masks and feeling mm -hmm. Feeling fancy, um, earplugs. I mean, I feel like in New York, I, I would have to basically bubble wrap myself. Yes, same. Like, <laughs> you the earplugs, you got the white noise machine, you got, you know, all the things. I've got apps like sleep meditation apps or sleep music apps or sleep breathing exercises, you know, and, um, you know, it's what they what they all say about your bedroom is your your bedroom should be for for two things only. Like you should not be scrolling your phone in bed. You shouldn't be in there watching TV. Um, you know, bedrooms really for two things. Um, and so to me, and then um, I've just you know since menopause, I've just I feel like I was I was joking around with with hubby. I was like I feel like such a delicate flower with like the fabrics that. I I can wear to bed now. It's like, like I'm literally only wearing like bamboo or um, silk. Um, mm -hmm. Some people, I haven't tried them yet, but people swear by linen sheets. Yes. I, well, I have a pair of linen sheets, but I feel like I have to wash them a lot to make them really soft. I feel like linen. I like they're a little, they're rough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I don't know. I, I washed them a bunch, and they did get softer. And you have to get like a really nice quality linen. Um, my husband likes them, but I haven't used them in a while. I like jersey, but they're definitely hotter. Yeah, but I, I love like jersey guarantee sheets as well. But like for like body, I have found oh, yeah. um, I can only wear one layer. So like yeah. either underwear or shorts or pants, not yeah. both. Like, <laughs> like I, I, things have to be able to breathe. Um, it's well, it's so funny because like this is where it, like the individual stuff comes in so much. Because mm -hmm. like my husband would be perfectly happy just sleeping naked, or I know some people are like, I can only sleep naked, or I can only sleep in underwear. Or just like I'm so happy that way. Like especially if you're warm, obviously, but just irrespective of hormones for a minute. And I like have to have like a layer of something on, like I, I would need something between me and the sheets. I just feel more comfortable that way. And like, I don't know. So everyone, you know, this is where, again, like find the thing that you're comfortable in, find the sheets that are comfortable. If you're sensitive to smells or like, I don't know, whatever it is, make the room nice and cool. Like all of those things. Oh, yeah, I've been that's... sleeping with an eye mask and earplugs since college every night because I had a roommate that was really loud and a garbage truck that would come outside the their dorm window. And like literally just since then, I, I just have to so, oh, so yeah. you know, find your routine. I love aromatherapy too. And um, mm, yeah, I don't. I don't think there's anything like magic about essential oils or anything. Yeah. Um, I mainly use them just because they're a less toxic version of other things that smell good. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, they make like lavender pillow sprays, like whatever yeah. you need to do to feel like, like you just, you get in bed and it's just a happy, you're happy to be there. Like, you know, it, it all adds up all those things. I have been recently, and this was like a hair thing that I discovered um, mm. The satin pillowcases. 
or silk mm. cases because um, my hairdresser had recommended it because I had like something, I had a photo shoot like the day after I was getting my hair done. Um, she's like, yeah, get a silk pillowcase and, you know, just sleep on, it does because they don't mess your hair up, but they're also very cool. Oh, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have my old lady pillow too. I've been using a tempur <laughs> pillow since like my 30s and I travel with it. Like, ah, like I'm it. not like perfectly supported and like, yeah. Yeah, then, I have um, the pillow between my legs going on that I just haven't given up since like pregnancy. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this now for the rest of my life. And then, my back. <laughs> you know, I think there's no, um, no shame in prioritizing your sleep either. And, you know, sometimes we have partners who have like different sleep schedules or different sleep needs. Um, children, we have pets. Like I've gone through various stages with locking the pets out of, I definitely got better sleep when I would lock the pets out of the room, but, um, you know, they they all have their own little personalities too, and children <laughs> as well. There's the ones yeah, who yeah. crawl into bed with you, and the ones who don't. Um, yep, yep. You know, yep. so so I feel like you know I would sleep perfectly fine through the night if I didn't have anybody bothering me, but that rarely happens, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, all right, and it's and we're coming up an hour and a half, so we'll go through the diet nutrition pieces, and then we'll call it a day because, of course, we could talk about this all day long. It's such yeah. a big topic. Um, yeah, so why don't we kind of talk through some food sources of some of these like big things we think about, whether it's melatonin or tryptophan or magnesium. We already talked about tart cherry, so that one's ticked off. Yeah, <laughs> tart but yeah. The juice or also the cherries themselves, you know. Yeah, the, um, the dried ones. Are yeah, yummy. One, one of my favorite um, desserts is like a little dessert charcuterie tray. I'll do some little nuts and some cherries or some berries and some dark chocolate. Um, just have a little dessert platter kind of thing. Um, there's really not that many like foods, um, you know, think about yogurt would have calcium and magnesium mm -hmm. in it mm -hmm. and those would be calming but yeah food wise like it's really it's more about what you're eating over the course of the day being balanced um mm -hmm. i do want to talk about one thing that, oh, yeah. that Go ahead. people um ask me about quite often um because they don't recommend napping mm, okay because our cortisol patterns, you know, ideally we wake up and they spike two hours after we wake up. That's the highest point of the day. Then it comes down in the afternoon. So it, it crashes in the afternoon. Um, so a lot of people, if they're not getting enough sleep, will nap in the mm -hmm. afternoon, which then just makes the cycle worse because then it's impacting your ability to fall asleep that night which is setting you on a later trajectory and then you're getting later and later and later and you're just like not at all attached to circadian rhythms. So, you know, what I recommend instead is fighting through that afternoon fatigue, getting yourself to bed a little earlier so that you're getting back on a cycle and then using the sunlight to support that. You know, the, the pineal gland is right behind our eyeballs. And the reason why it's right behind our eyeballs is because it's sensitive to light. So that's what's responsible for circadian rhythm. You know, basically when we, when our eyes are exposed to sunlight in the morning, it, it triggers that countdown to bedtime, you know, to the time when melatonin production is going to ramp back up again. Mm -hmm. um, so waking up and like opening all the blinds, exposing our eyes to light, getting outside if we can, that's a perfect time. I like to um, have my coffee, go out putter around my garden, you know, check out, check out all my little bees and, and birds and things, um, just to get some sunlight so that, that I'm more in line. Um, obviously I live in a part of the country where we have very long winters. Um, yeah. I yeah. And do, short um, days. <laughs> you have a happy light, you know, mm -hmm. 30 bucks on Amazon, get yourself one of those 10,000 Lux happy lights. Um, they go by different brands. Um, I will put that up for 30 minutes in the winter um, as I'm having my coffee to, to sort of trigger that circadian rhythm. But yeah, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't recommend napping because um, our Western society is not 
built for that as opposed to, you know, some places where siesta and then they're getting up and then they're eating dinner at 10 o'clock. Oh, but they're eating dinner so late. Oh God, I can't, I just, such a struggle to be on that schedule. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, it's like the whole society is built around that or where where ours isn't. Most people work nine to five and it's like, okay, well that means you got to get up probably at six 30 or seven. So, um, you know, fight through, fight through the urge to nap if at all possible, unless you're like very much in a deficit and trying to catch up. And there are, I think there are some people though, like professional athletes is is a great example where like they nap, they they take long naps every day. They're doing, you know, they're training twice a day. They're, it's like, it's just their entire day is really structured on like training and eating and granted they have a life too and they're doing other things. But, um, I think there are some populations where naps are, they work for them, but, um, others, they don't. I definitely am one of those people that I, I, I will, I can rest, but I cannot fall asleep no matter how hard I try during the day. My husband can pass out, but I do think it really messes him up later. So, um, I'm, I'm yeah. jealous of people who can, you know, I know, I know people who take 10 minute power naps or 20 yes. minute power naps and they're like awake and ready to go. And I'm like, if I fall asleep, I wake up, I'm like, what day is it? Yes. Where, what's my name? <laughs> Where, like, I've, I'm so disoriented and confused. Yeah. It just mm-hmm. makes it worse. So I try yeah. to power through and just get back yeah. on a, a regular schedule. That was- that was me like postpartum, but at the, but I also like, I needed every ounce of sleep I could get at any moment in time and day. So like, but yeah, I just remember waking up from some crazy naps, just being like, I have no idea what's happening right now. <laughs> Who is this child? <laughs> but anyways, um, is there anything else we want to, I know we talked about like so many different things today. Um, and you know, I, I think we did focus on, well, we, I mean, focus on a lot of lifestyle behaviors. We focus on different supplements and strategies Food wise, I think it was really more focused on just the general patterns, eating enough, Mm -hmm. um, you know, because because, yes, some foods are obviously rich in magnesium, whether it's chocolate or, you know, fortified greens or, you know, whatever it is, um, dairy, et cetera. Um, Like, yes, you can get all these different sources of things. But at the end of the day, like eating a piece of chocolate is not going to cut it. Obviously, it's really about the overall dietary pattern. But yeah, is there anything else you kind of want to throw in here before we wrap it up? I think that's it, you know. Out of the food stuff, the carbohydrates is probably the one that matters the most, you know, Mm -hmm. making sure that you're eating quality carbohydrates, that you're eating enough carbohydrates, um, you know, because they really do have that relaxing effect on your adrenals. Um, So learning how to sort of maximize that, um, not eating too low carb, especially at dinner. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. to make sure that that you're able to support rest. But yeah, I mean, we covered nutrition, sleep, stress, (laughs) environment, uh, exercise. So that's basically supplements. So that's all the tests. Even testing a little bit. We dabbled in the testing a little bit. Um, Yeah. So, you know, I do like to do cortisol testing on my my patients. Oh, yeah. Why don't you mention that briefly? Yeah. So like, you know, in addition to this sleep apnea testing that my my husband's doing, I'm curious Mm -hmm. to see what happens with Mm -hmm. that. But um, I do test cortisol diurnal patterns. So um, what's happening over the course of 24 hours, um, because sometimes it can be problems there that's Mm -hmm. contributing to it. We'll either see... um, sort of a second wind situation that's happening um, or what what we sometimes call the Sunday scaries where, you know, you're sort of stri- psyching yourself up about what you have to do tomorrow and that's impacting your sleep. Sometimes mm-hmm. we see that, you know, it's actually fine at bedtime, but then it's coming up overnight and that's usually the blood sugar thing where blood sugar is going too low. That's bringing cortisol mm-hmm. up earlier than it should be. Um, so looking at, at that, but also the patterns of adrenal dysfunction, right? So I kind of talk about two phases of adrenal dysfunction. Other people break it into more. I think two is um, the most simplified way to think about it. We've got kind of overdrive phase where you feel that you're stressed, your cortisol is mm-hmm. high, your cortisone's high, your dopamine's high, your norepinephrine, epinephrine, at DHEA, everything's high. Um, and I feel like most women, especially high achieving women, um, can stay there for quite a long time and yeah. normally your body is like adapting. Yeah. What happens when we get into burnout or overwhelm is all of that collapses. So 
cortisol goes low, cortisone goes low, um, dopamine goes low, norepinephrine, epinephrine. So your adrenal resilience is low. Um, I've also been seeing that pattern, this like flat cortisol line where you're not getting a spike in the morning. You basically wake up and it's just downhill from there. Like that's the most energy you're ever going to have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've had that happen twice now. Um, and you feel it. It's like, you just don't feel like you ever wake up and get going. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're also seeing that after COVID infection. So about oh, interesting. Six months after COVID, um, we're seeing this flat lined cortisol pattern. And, you know, it's really hard because you want to do all the things you want to be mm-hmm. doing, but you just like, your tank is dry, right? So then we have to support with like, you know, sunlight and regular meals and getting active in the morning and, you know, doing all these things to to restore and replenish if you are truly in that burnout or overwhelm phase. Um, yeah. You know, where the, the overdrive stress phase, that, that I consider more of like a warning bell kind of situation. Like yeah. you better do something to address the stress because- it's it's impacting you more than you think it might be. Um, yeah. And we also don't know how long you can sustain this. Um, but I was saying mm-hmm. like two times in my life, I've, I've felt that. And, you know, the first one was like publishing my book, um, mm-hmm. you know, such a short timeline. And yeah. the second time was after COVID. I, I had that where it's just like, I, you know, I, I want to do the things. I just, there's, there's nothing in the tank. Yeah. You know. And you're using like Dutch testing for that? Yeah, yeah. I use Dutch for that. Um, but I, you could also do like a 24-hour saliva test mm-hmm. or like con- conventional medicine 24-hour saliva test. The only thing I yep. really don't recommend is like if you the have a doctor for for cortisol yeah. testing, they're going to look at a single point and it's, yeah. it's like useless, useless. data. Yeah. <laughs> like okay great. it looks it's, fine it's, yeah it's, 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 it's at 10 a.m and honestly like yeah. most people's looks fine at 10 a.m you know it's sure. it's what's it doing the rest of the day um and then what are you doing with it after so like yeah you know are you getting rid of it are you deactivating it to cortisone like where's it going um mm-hmm. some people like they're like preferentially deactivating it and it's like oh okay great it's still there we can just grab it back for you um some people are getting rid of too much. And I see that with like sort of a chronic extreme stress situation. Mm. Like, you know, your hypothalamus just wants, like its main goal in life is for you to survive. So if it's reading this stressful situation and your your adrenals are working so hard, they're making cortisol and your brain's like, nope, get rid of it. So like you're mm-hmm. making it, you're just not benefiting from it. So you know, we have to kind of figure out what's going on there. I've actually also, another thing I see relatively common is um, when there's like a chronic infection. Oh yeah. We don't know about that Mm -hmm. causing this sort of chronic stress situation. And, you know, so many of my clients are like, but I don't feel stressed. I feel fine. It's like, well, you've got hemorrhagic E. coli. So like, (laughs) That's the internal stress, right? <laughs> Probably your brain's interpreting that as yeah. like a stressful situation. Yeah. So we mm-hmm. never we never know. It's it's you know, it's one of those things there's like general yeah. things to try and sure. We can work through a bunch of them and like then decide, okay, well that didn't work. Like um I'm gonna pursue some deeper testing or working with a practitioner who can sort of help me figure out what's going on because I tried, you know, magnesium. If you try magnesium, yeah. you try a bedtime snack, you try yep. sunlight in the morning and it's not working, then it's like, okay, well, let's figure out what's going on for you. Well, like GI stuff, sleep yeah. is often very, very complicated. It's often not just one thing. It's really hard to disentangle like what's going on. And again, people want like quick solutions because they're so freaking miserable. And I can understand that, but it usually takes time, unfortunately, no, to kind of I mean, parse it all out and treat, right? It's exactly the same as GI. I talk about yeah. like, okay, well, sit down, take three deep breaths before yeah. you eat, chew your food thoroughly, eat fiber, probiotics, yeah, probiotics, yeah, yeah, yeah. like if that doesn't help, then it's like, okay, well, now we get to figure out what's going on. But like, you got to be doing those foundational. Yeah. 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 You know, totally. 
totally. Yeah, well, Melissa, you. this was so great. Um, where can everyone find you online if they want to learn more from you, work with you, all that stuff? Yeah, Instagram is where I'm posting most things these days. Uh, it's the dot hormone dietitian, um, the dot hormone dot dietitian dot com, and that's <laughs> dietitian with two T's. Um, and my website is also the hormone dietitian dot com. I do have a, a book, a cookbook on PCOS. Um, and I work with clients one-on-one uh, -on -one in group settings, and I also have some online programs. So awesome. yeah, I'm, I'm available and mostly PCOS, perimenopause, um, menopause. I really do love working with athletes, um, you know, supporting them with their hormones uh, through their athletic goals and pursuits as well. Um, you know, especially if they have good foundation in sports nutrition and are just having trouble marrying that to what they need to do for hormone balance. Awesome. And you mentioned you have some courses too, right? Yeah. So my main course, it's called the PCOS Root Cause Roadmap. We should be launching again um, this fall. That's that's the main one. I have awesome. some, some mini courses too, but all of that is on my website or um, in the link in my Instagram bio. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. I know we went a little bit over today, but, um, but yeah, we could, I'm gonna have to get you back on because this is so fun to <laughs> talk yeah. about more. I mean, I honestly, I think it would be really fun to talk about, um, you know, some more, even just focusing more on like the perimenopausal women group and dealing with some, whether it's like weight gain, I know like you've posted a bunch of like weight loss in menopause and like all that kind of stuff. And, um, and as you said, like, we definitely are never talking about doing that during an active training cycle, but you know, there's some, there are appropriate times to work on these things in certain individuals, um, and just other yeah. topics I think would be fun to talk about. So maybe at a later point we can get together and do that. That would be awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Claire. Yeah. Awesome. Yay. That's our show for today. If you're still listening, I know it was a really long episode, but I hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot. Um, if you did, please make sure to hit follow and subscribe wherever you listen. And if you have a minute, I would be so grateful if you could also rate and review my show wherever you are listening. If you're able to support the show financially, I do have a Patreon page. I'd love to see you over there. Patreon members get some great perks as well as merch and huge discounts on my digital downloads and so much more. So thank you so much for your support. Please always feel free to email me, Claire at E for Endurance, if you have any feedback, questions, or topic requests. Again, if you want to contribute to this best of uh, these two episodes I'm trying to put together. would love to hear from you. All right. Thanks so much. See you all next time.